Hello, my name is Daniel, and this is the Engineering Success Podcast, episode 21. Well, guys, I hope you're doing well. I know it's been a month, and I know that I keep on saying that I'm going to do an episode every two weeks. Uh, It's been one heck of a month, so please forgive me, but I have a lot of fun things that are going on. Obviously, those of you that know me know that I have a wedding, and approximately 50 days actually let me look that up hey google how many days away is june 18th google says it's exactly 50 days from the day that i'm recording this so yeah uh, it's feeling really real (laughs) we're less than two months away i have a couple last logistics that i need to take care of like the bar um but yeah uh very exciting um My bachelor party is next weekend, so also very exciting. But yeah, just a lot of things to be happy about. Now, let's uh, give a couple shout-outs. First shout-out goes to our top-tier supporter. You, too, can be a top-tier supporter by supporting the podcast, like John Ott. Shout-out to John Ott for being a top-tier supporter. If you want to be a top-tier supporter, $10 a month on Anchor or on Patreon. Links are in the description. And I will shout you out at the beginning of every single episode at the podcast with any work appropriate phrase, name, emoji, whatever you want. Also, I want to give a shout out to our two new YouTube subscribers, Josh Hessler and Evan Eisenberg. Thank you guys for the support. And if you want to watch Engineering Success on YouTube, if you're not currently watching it on YouTube, then you can go to Engineering Success Podcast or um, engineering success on YouTube, you'll find me there, and I post snippets there of every single episode. And if you're fi- watching me currently on YouTube and you want to find out where else to listen to me, you can listen to me on Anchor, you can listen to me on Spotify, Apple, Spreaker, Pod, Beam, Pod, whatever, podcasts, anything that you want to listen to your podcast on, I'm likely there. And if I'm not there, let me know, and I will find my way there. Um, what else? Oh yeah, if you have your own questions, I'll be answering my first viewer question today. I'll be reading it out for today. Uh, then you can email me at engring.success at gmail.com. And then again, whenever you're watching me on YouTube, make sure you comment, make sure you like, make sure you subscribe. And whenever you're watching me on Apple Podcasts, make sure you give me a five-star review there. Any work-appropriate five-star review on Apple Podcasts, I will read out on the podcast. All right. Let's get to our recurring segment. Our recurring segment is LinkedIn Lunatics. As many of you may know, that my favorite new subreddit on LinkedIn is r slash LinkedIn lunatics. So you can find a good dose of funny questions like this if you also go to r LinkedIn lunatics. All right, let me get this link up. All right, so I'm going to switch my view. And there it is. The LinkedIn lunatics, this is actually not a lunatic. This is somebody making fun of LinkedIn lunatics. So I figured it would be appropriate. This is every cliche LinkedIn post ever. One, candidate asked for 27000 I offered 350000 because I'm great, hee hee. Two, rejected by exactly 2,035 companies now placed in the Solar System Administration. <laughs> Three, I saw a homeless boy yesterday, taught him data science, and now today you know him as Elon Musk. Yep, I've seen that one before. Four, work for Mars is best, right guys? Vote now. Yeah, just begging for engagement. Five, look at my beautiful vacation selfie. Totally irrelevant, but hee hee. Yeah, usually there's uh, an inappropriate amount of visibility on those types of posts. Six, first salary guys bought Antilla. XOXO, I don't even want to know what Antilla is. Seven, I interviewed a candidate yesterday, couldn't offer her the job, so I offered her my car instead. Kindness rocks. LOL. Eight, from day one day to one day one, from one day to day one, I've been chosen as the new god J Shri myself. Okay, I don't know where that one was from. I haven't seen that one. Nine, I took an Uber yesterday. The driver hadn't eaten eaten anything since 1932, so I became a pizza myself. And ten, do you love your mother? Celebrate, react for yes. Curious, react for no. Stop this nonsense, please. And then the emoji of the obviously disappointed man. 
Um, so I thought that was funny. Uh, <laughs> that's LinkedIn is turned into a cesspool, and I personally use it to advertise a podcast and occasionally network with people, but I definitely don't surf to LinkedIn, and LinkedIn influencers like that are the reason why. Sorry, guys. I just wanted to make sure that I included a trigger warning here. I'm about to discuss the incident of sexual violence and just wanted to make sure that if you wanted to avoid that kind of content, you could take this time to skip that content. So if you skipped it right after the ad break, it's after I think nine minute 40 mark, then you'll be able to avoid that part of the podcast. Thanks. All right, I think I have one more LinkedIn lunatic. Yes, all right, here we go. Here's our next LinkedIn lunatic. So, some of you might remember this. There was this CEO of this company, it was called Gravity Payments. And this dude right here went super viral because he was like, the minimum wage at my company is 70K. And like he like took away all of his all of his profit or whatever, and he, I guess, got super viral and went famous for this. Well, turns out he is also a, a LinkedIn influencer, and now he's a LinkedIn lunatic, or at least he is allegedly, or he is charged to be a LinkedIn lunatic because he just got charged with two counts of fourth degree assault in Seattle and is under investigation for felony rape of a drug victim in Palm Springs. So that's terrible. Um, that is terrible. So I, I think it's kind of interesting to read the article, so I'm not gonna make you read it with me. But I stole this art, I, I took this article from KUOW.org. Uh, I guess it's a local news agency in, let's find out where it is. It, it KUOW, it's NPR, local. Um, and the story was by Ashley Haruko. And so, yeah, he went famous for lowering his salary to 70K. And he was accused of trigger warning. Uh, should have, I'll, apply, I'll apply a trigger warning on the title of this video. Uh, is accused of grabbing a woman's throat twice after he tried to kiss her and she rejected his advances. Yeah, not cool, man. Um, he has three misdemeanor charges. Assault with sexual motivation, assault, and reckless driving. And yeah, he uh, he went viral for lowering his one million dollar salary to seventy thousand. Um, if you're the CEO of a company, maybe your salary is lower, but maybe you have other ways of uh, taking money out. Um, okay, through his attorney, he says the allegations are false, but I believe that he was charged. So, anyways, um, he goes on to say they go on to say that he respects the legal process and cut, it is confident that he will be vindicated in court, says his lawyer by the la name of Mark Middaw. Um, very detailed, very detailed, very detailed explanations of the timeline. And uh, other back line, back, background is that in 2015, uh, his ex-wife was going to have a TEDx talk at the University of Kentucky, and she alleged that he punched, slap, punched, slapped, and waterboarded her. So, and they didn't publish that because his uh, attorneys said that the footage was defamatory. So, history of being a lunatic, allegedly, and allegedly is a very bad person, so. Those are this week in LinkedIn Lunatics. I'll post the links to the stories in the description below so that, that way you can read them. Uh, Cause I, I remember this story going viral and being pretty happy about it, but very unfortunate, very, very, very unfortunate outcome for this LinkedIn Lunatic. All right. So let's get in, let's take a quick break for ads. Hey guys, I want to tell you about a new podcast called Tequila Time. The Tequila Time podcast is a weekly podcast of fusion of tech, entertainment, business, travel, and more. 
and of tequila, of course. Dive right in as your host, Kellen and Marius, explore relevant topics to the business world and beyond. Join them in their travels around the world and learn about how new technology and the newest Silicon Valley trends. Hear their interviews with special guests possessing unparalleled knowledge within their disciplines. You can find them on anchor.fm slash tequila time and on Instagram as the tequila time podcast. And then we'll come right back with our first viewer question. All right, and I am back. I hope you got an ad there. All right, the question is, hello, Daniel. I have a question for the podcast, and I would be interested to hear your thoughts and hopefully spur your listeners' thoughts. All right, everybody listen up and be prepared to give me your thoughts. Please uh, comment down below your thoughts after I'm done reading the question. And if you are on Anchor, I will ask this question out through Spotify and through Anchor. So if you're listening on Anchor, the question should pop up when you're trying to listen. The question is, I am in a new position as a project manager for my company. All of my time so far has been from my structural background, but now I am getting into more mechanical driven jobs. While this is very fun and exciting, I feel behind the eight ball on things sometimes. What advice would you give to someone to quickly train themselves on a subject so they have a basic understanding of things? Any resources you know of, YouTube channels, podcasts? Thank you. This is from John. Well, thanks, John, for the question. You know what? As you may know, I am not a project manager, so I don't have that first-hand experience. I did do a little research on on uh, YouTube, and I didn't find any YouTube channels that I liked. They were all kind of super generic and, like, the kind of things that you'd see, like, in a learning management platform, like super slideshowy, how to project manage type things, and that's not really quite what you're looking for, but, you know, my first place my brain goes to is, I imagine that there's, if there's mechanically driven jobs, this is a consulting background, I'm assuming, um, and you were a structural engineer, so you worked on these jobs, and they're probably multi-discipline jobs, you have structural engineers, which is what you did, or structural designers, and then they had uh, mechanical, electrical process, and it makes sense that mechanical kind of drives the project. Uh, the mechanical part of the project is, and the process part of the project, sometimes people lump those together, really uh, impact the electrical and the foundations, the structural. Uh, that, that is kind of the core of this, these projects, and they kind of build out from there. I'm guessing that for all these mechanical driven projects that there is a mechanical engineering lead. And it might take a little bit of extra work and time, but one thing I would recommend doing is maybe shadowing that lead and, and maybe sitting in on some of their design meetings that they have with their engineers and their designers and, and, and spending a little bit more time with them uh, because, again, you don't have that as much background doing what they do and, you know, it, it won't come right away. I, I mean, I don't... I mean, I, nobody would expect you to be able to get it right away. And the other thing I, I, I remember is that I think that you were probably hired into this position, placed in the posi this position by somebody that knew that you had a structural background. So they're, I'm guessing that they're not expecting you to be an expert in all things mechanical. And so I would just take that attitude of knowing that you, you're not expected to know all things mechanical people that are working with you know that your background is structural and you can even kind of say that with a place of humility uh, whenever you're working as a project manager but you know i think that if you do a really good job of the project management aspects of the job so place a lot place a lot of energy on the things that you do know about like how to run a project effectively being highly communicative engaging people then i think that that will definitely result in a successful outcome for you and combining that with spending some more time shadowing the mechanical engineers uh, would definitely be helpful. My background is mechanical but I can't say that I have ran a project so again I'm not the most qualified to respond to this but um, anybody that is in the audience uh, feel free to send in a list of any podcasts or YouTube channels that you listen to to help spruce yourself up more on mechanical engineering concepts and and for engineering consulting for energy and chemicals or 
uh, food and beverage, uh, whatever, whatever background you have, uh, I'd really be curious to hear the audience and everybody else's response to this question. But for me, I, I just really lean heavily on my mechanical SME. Um, acknowledge that that's just not my specialty, but and I'm not going to get it right away. But really work hard and, and be highly communicative about the project management aspects of the job. And if, if you you don't have to know everything, but if you can run a project well, then people will definitely appreciate that. So. That's my take. Sorry, John, I'm not the best responder here for this question, but I know I appreciate you. I appreciate your support of the podcast, and I know that you're going to do great in the role. So cheers to you, John. Thanks for the question, and we'll revisit this in the next episode of the podcast. All right. Next question is from R Ask Engineers. The question is titled, why do projects take so long IRL? So IRL means in real life for those of us that don't know. I am working in mechanical electrical field. We make automation projects products for OEMs, original equipment manufacturers. Something I've noticed is that projects take dot 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 years. I understand testing can be a holdup, but other than that, it's like people just move snail pace. Me included now, too. In college, most of these types of things I could take care of in two hours. Now, I feel like a medium-sized task can take days. Like a problem that requires me to do a little digging or use more than one brain cell, it's 24 hours minimum. I am not this person. I think it's exhaustion. I'm so confused. Does anyone else notice this is happening to them? Okay, so... I'm going to contend that when you were in college, you were applying things in two ways mainly. Tests, homeworks, and then obviously projects. But, you know, I think that we're most we relate most of our college experience to the thing we do in tests. And remember in tests, we're under working on our, most of the time we're working under a very tight timeline and we're just trying to get it as close to right as possible to get as many points on the test as we can. And on homework, um, again, you have a limited duration of time fixed amount of time, the time is fixed, and the product is whatever product you generate, and then you're graded on that. Well, in the real world, you know, times are fixed, and you have a schedule, but the product is under different constraints. Not unlike your tests or homeworks where you can get things wrong, I mean, yes, you can get things wrong in the real world, but the stakes are a lot higher. And there's a lot of other nuances in professional applications, like the financing, the contract, the, again, my whole job, contract, um, the regulations, the safety requirements. I mean, there's just so many more things that go in, and the stakes are significant. And they can be financial, they can be liability, they can be safety. So... That's why projects take so long in real life. There's just, the pressure is higher, and the amount of things you have to account for, in my opinion, is much larger as well. So, yeah, in college, I mean, you can kind of scrape together a solution and get a solution, but in the real world, um, there's just a lot more things to consider. So, in my opinion, that is why projects take so much longer in the real world than they do in college. So, anyways... I hope you find that helpful, and I hope you, that you maybe take some time to step outside of what you're doing and, and think about all the other context that's kind of slowing things down and all the other bureaucracy that's important, that's why it exists, and try to understand why in the larger context of the projects that you're working on, why those things are important, so you can gain an extra appreciation for them. And I think that um, obviously, you know, there's multiple tracks for engineering. There's super technical and then there's more commercial business sides, but appreciating those other aspects and the reasons why things take as long as they do or need to be checked as many times as they do, I think can only make you a more well-rounded engineer. So I encourage you to think about that, but that, in my opinion, is why projects take so long in real life. All right, next question. What? Industrial engineer do in construction domain. What does an industrial engineer do in the construction domain? And then they don't really say anything else. 
All right, here's my answer. So I responded to this one, and I will be linking them to this podcast and the YouTube video. You can do a lot of things, is what I said. So another responder that responded to this said, optimization, and I think that's what industrial engineers do. But I would like to expand on that. So I work, those of you that know me and those of you that don't, I work for a large EPC firm. So engineering, procurement, construction. We're talking, we do engineering only projects, we do construction only projects, we do engineering and procurement projects, we do procurement and construction projects, we do a lot of different types of projects. And there's just a lot of things that in my opinion, I think that an industrial engineer would be suited for. So. The first one is project controls or change management. So that's like tracking changes from the initial scope and then making sure you get compensated for those changes. So that's called change orders or change management or change proposals. So whenever something changes, you with your engineering driven mind and your attention to detail and your general understanding of how the whole project comes together as an industrial engineer would be well, may, may be well suited to working in project controls or change management. And yes, that is a legitimate field. Uh, you might not be able to get your professional engineering license doing that. I don't even know if industrial engineers can get their professional engineering license. I should probably look that up. Um, but yeah, I think that uh, it's definitely a great career and you can make a great living doing that. The next one is a planner or scheduler for construction activities. So think like, we, in my company we call it, we have planners and schedulers and we have people that do execution planning as well. Um, so think of sequencing. So when, when what gets installed, what? And when things arrive to the site, what gets put on the ground when? Um, how you bring, um, w how you use cranes and how you bring, um, sorry, Twyla's barking in the background, that's so annoying. Um, uh, if you bring things, when you, where you put your materials when they arrive to the site, how, timing things around to the site so that that way they're ready to be installed whenever the construction people need to install them. Uh, you definitely need engineers or people that are experienced in industrial uh, processes uh, to do that. And an industrial engineer with their background, with a little bit of experience, in my opinion, would be well suited to doing that. So that's another thing to consider. And that's something that people with industrial engineering degrees have done in my company. Next one is procurement and supply chain. So this one is like, so think evaluating bids from smaller companies and maybe setting up bidding portals and setting up uh, procurement events and uh, basically running little mini projects to purchase large pieces of equipment, like in the multi millions of dollars, uh, large quantities of bulk steel for building a structure, um, a tank, um, another a specialty company to build a tank, a specialty engineer to do corrosion or uh, or lightning protection analysis. Uh, and these in industrial engineers, in my opinion, are suited for this, especially one that has some experience because you're, you're running these little projects, you're optimizing uh, the workflow, you're timing out these procurements, and you're working with schedulers and planners and project managers to make sure that everything runs together and comes together. These projects are huge, and engineers are super, super, super valuable for all of them and all different phases of these projects. Another role I think that, with, again, experience, would be doing these other roles is uh, project management. So an industrial engineer could uh, run engineering projects or construction projects or teams of maintenance people in a plant or people doing a quick turnaround. So think like really fast paced construction projects in an operating facility. They shut it down, you have to replace a boiler or something like that. And your completion time the faster you complete, the more, the less runtime is lost for the facility. So, again, tons of different roles you can do in these projects. These usually, again, come after more experience. Uh, but I know people that have advanced their career from beyond this type of role into more commercial and then leadership, executive leadership type roles after that. So, the question, what does an industrial engineer do in the construction domain? A lot of things. That isn't even a comprehensive list. I think that there's even more things than that that an industrial engineer can do. But again, I think that the industrial engineering degree is very versatile and has a lot of application in the construction engineer, construction industry. So best of luck to you. 
if you're a student, I can't really tell what you are from this question, but if you're a student, I definitely would consider looking into construction companies. Definitely a lot of things you can do. And uh, it's I've enjoyed working in the industry and it's very fulfilling to me. Next question. This one is from R applying to college. Unpopular opinion. Highly selective schools admit the best writers, not the best students. Edit one. Highly selective schools admit the best writers between students with similar stats, which is almost always the case. Well, duh. I, I don't really, <laughs> I don't really view this as an unpopular opinion. Okay. Okay. And I don't know why this person is saying this. Okay, if I have two people that have like the same resume, same type of experience, similar resumes, but one of them is a better writer or a more highly effective communicator than the other, that person's resume is now a little bit better than the other person's resume. So it kind of, I mean, people correct me if I'm wrong, but it kind of makes sense that the students that are the best writers admit the best writers but not the best students and then the edit basically contradicts the entire title of the question. I'm sorry, I just, I don't get it. Yes, students that are comparable but one of them writes better than the other, the one that writes better than the other has a better chance of getting into the selective school. And I don't know why people poo-poo writing so much. I don't know why that's the case, but I will tell you. Effective communication skills get you somewhere. Um, not like I've been a lot of places and I can say that, that from like fact, but I will say that my communication skills, in my opinion, are an asset. And they have helped me out in my role. My ability to write and effectively communicate my thoughts has put me in a position where I'm able to interact with decision makers in my organization. Um, so, engineers out there, I know that this wasn't in an engineering subreddit, but engineering students out there, do not discount your writing classes. Take them seriously. You're going to be writing tons of emails whenever you're working. You're going to be doing tons of writing. Yes. You're going to be writing, either you're going to be writing reports or proposals. I mean, there is going to be some writing involved in your job. So don't think that just because you're getting a STEM degree that you won't have to write. Your writing skills are important because, in my opinion, the work that an engineer does is not useless, but less useful if they can't effectively communicate what they did. And if they can't communicate it at all, then what is it worth to me? And if you need somebody else to communicate it to you, communicate it on your behalf, then you're, guess, you're less useful. So, again, writing skills are important. All right, next question. This one is on R Ask Engineers. Engineers without a degree, I have some questions for you. I'm a mechanical engineering student. I'm not the best at school, but I do love the craft. I hate mindless assignments, but I always put in work for exams. How, far, how hard is it to find a job without a degree? Is GPA important at all? Can one become a certified as a mechanical engineer without a college degree? If you already have a few jobs in your resume, does it really matter? Have you done any freelance work? What was it like? I'm sorry for the blandness of the question, and regardless of the answer, I will still finish college and get my degree. I'm pretty much almost done, so might as well. Thank you for the time and consideration of my questions. Okay. Let's go down the line. How hard is it to find a job without a degree? Now, if you want to be an engineer and do an engineering role, almost impossible. Might have been, at least, unless you like go come up through construction and you want to be like a construction project manager. But again, you asked engineers, how hard is it to find a job without, an, without a degree? So I assume a strictly engineering job. Is GPA important at all? Yes. You have to... <laughs> Having a good GPA will make it easier for you to get your first job, 
And then once you get your first job, then people mainly just care about what's on your resume and what you've done. If you already have a few jobs in your resume, does it really matter? Oh, sorry, go back one. Can one become certified as a mechanical engineer without a college degree? All right, let's go on the National Society of Professional Engineers. So this is the National Society of Professional Engineers. If you are interested in becoming a national, uh, professional engineer, you would want to check out this website and then your state. If you're in Texas, Texas has their own state website. Every state in the U.S. has their own website on professional engineering licensing, and you would want to look there. So this is what has to happen for you to become a professional engineer in general. You become an engineering intern, so you graduate from an engineering program, and then you gain your professional experience. So become an engineering intern, so you graduate from a program, you take the engineering fundamentals of engineering, FE exam, and then you get your engineering intern status, engineering and training. Then you gain your professional experience, and I believe it's four years, yes, four years of qualifying engineering experience. And then there's one other exam you need to take. It is your professional engineering principles and practice of engineering, PE exam in your state. And you don't actually have to wait. They, they did a process called, at least in Texas, they did a process called decoupling, where you can actually take, again, this varies by state, but in Texas, this is where I am. Uh, you actually can take your PE exam anytime after you take your FE exam and become an engineering and training. And then once you have the four years of experience and you can prepare an application and you get sponsorship support from other professional engineers, and then you pass the PE exam, then you can apply for licensure with your state and again, any other qualifications and other documentation that your state asks for, then you submit those and then hopefully you get uh, picked as a professional engineer. So let's get even more specific. In the state of Texas, you must have earned one of the following degrees or degree combinations. So yes, you need a degree. So you need either one, an accredited degree, so it's described below here, Bachelor of Science degree in Engineering from an EAC or ABET, that's where I went to an ABET accredited program in the US, or an equivalent from Canada or Mexico, the Washington Accord or other substantially equivalent places, or a board approved combination of a bachelor's degree in one of the mathematical, physical, or engineering sciences, and a graduate degree in engineering from a university with an ABET accredited undergrad program, so that's an accredited degree, or a non-accredited degree, like a bachelor's in engineering technology from an ABET program, or a bachelor's degree in mathematical program approved by the Texas Board of Professional Engineers, and you will find, each state has a list, Texas has their own, and all degrees must have eight hours of math, beyond trig, and 20 hours of engineering sciences courses. So, yeah. You need to have the coursework, related coursework to, and graduate uh, with a degree to become a professional engineer. So yeah, again, you still need a degree. So next part of that question, you asked, if you already have a few jobs in your resume, does it really matter? Yes, because without the degree, you still cannot become certified as a professional engineer. Have you done any freelance work? Well, it was like, I have not but I bet it would have been great. And um, don't apologize for the blandness of your question. Um, I encourage you to finish, as you said, I encourage you to finish your degree. It is important. You need it to become a professional engineer, at least in the US. And it is difficult to find a job without your degree. And give your best. GPA is important. It'll make your life a little bit easier whenever you're applying for your first job out of college. All right, thanks for the question. Next question. First job. Should I negotiate the salary? I will be graduating next month. I started my first internship at my company in January. Now they want me to stay as a full-time software engineer. The pay is similar to what I had for internship. Should I negotiate? By the way, I have not been applying for jobs recently, so I do not have any competing offer. Okay, so I'd say that it doesn't hurt. 
I don't know how big this company is and what kind of formalities they have, but you're definitely worth more with your degree than without your degree. So you should, and this is one of those things where you're working for them now and they want you to come on full time. So I think that your transition from engineer to graduate full-time professional is a perfectly reasonable time for you to bring up a salary increase. They may already be thinking about this. So I wouldn't worry about the fact that you haven't asked about it and I wouldn't worry about asking it I would definitely just say, yeah, go ahead and ask. Because um, even I, um, again, one of those internships, I did an internship during my school year once and midway through my internship after I'd worked there for a full year, I asked for a pay increase because I'd been there for a year and I was significantly more experienced. And asking for a raise is a great learning experience for you. So in your situation, yes, I think it's appropriate to negotiate the salary. I think that situations where it's a little bit more difficult to negotiate the salary is if you didn't communicate hardline salary expectations to any, this is just in general, to a company that you applied for and then they give you a job offer. I think it's still appropriate to try to negotiate, but if you set a salary expectation that's kind of low and then the company meets that expectation, obviously you can ask, but it's likely that they're not going to move too much. So. Um, but in this situation, uh, if you're, you're already working for the company as an intern and they want to convert you to full-time, say that's great, but I expect a pay increase along with that and that should kind of get the conversation going. Maybe go into that conversation with an idea of what kind of total compensation package that you'd be looking for and kind of maybe do some research behind the scenes. Again, don't know if this is a small company or a large company, but do some research behind the scenes and see if you can find any history on how they deal with that with interns that are getting converted to full time. But hey, cheers to you. Congratulations on your upcoming congratulations on your upcoming graduation and that pay raise that's coming your way. All right. Next question. This is on our ask engineers. Denied job because I called myself an engineer in training. Asked for feedback and was told if you have all the requirements, that wouldn't be training anymore. So this is a weird one, and I wanted to know what other people's experiences have been like. Just an FYI, I am working towards becoming a civil engineer for reference. I applied for a job. The requirement said you must have an engineering degree, which I do. It did not say you needed to be licensed. Okay, key differentiation there. The manager reached out to ask me clarifying questions, which I, if he had read the application, it was all in there. Regardless, I answered politely and I asked for feedback for moving forward and the response was All that you need is some rewarding. There are a few references to in training that makes me think you're not a full-fledged engineer If you've completed all the work received the degree, etc. You're no longer in training at least in my opinion Otherwise your application looks okay. I followed up by explaining the title of engineer is protected and legally I cannot use that unless I'm licensed. I also explained that to get licensed you have to pass the PE exam and have four years of work experience under licensed engineers. Right now after passing the FE I have an EIT certificate which is the correct process in becoming a licensed engineer. I currently have two years of experience. Oh, I got in a circle there. I currently have two years experience and have taken and passed the FE exam as my state allows you to take it whenever you want after pass passing the FE. I'm working on getting my C at California PE license, as you can do that at two years plus the state-specific exams, so I will have a license number soon, which will allow me to use the title engineer. The company I applied to is massive and has plenty of engineers in different disciplines, but I guess this hiring manager does not have a license nor understands the process of becoming an engineer. I have heard of many people at this company calling themselves engineers, i.e. computer engineer, software engineer without having any sort of license, and I know that happens a lot depending on the type of engineering taking place. I could lie and say that I was an engineer, but I know I cannot be doing that, and I worry that I could get myself in trouble if I did. What are your thoughts and or experiences with things like this? How should I approach this moving forward? I was clear in my application that I was an EIT and that I passed the FE and PE exams. I have since corrected the spot where I say passing my PE to also say waiting for the experience requirement to get my license number. So that hopefully in the future that this is crystal clear. But I really want to work for this company and I don't want to keep missing out on opportunities because I call myself an EIT. There are currently three other job postings I want to apply at this company, but I have no idea what to do. 
Interesting question. Okay, let me take a sip of water while I think this over. So let's go back here for a second. The manager said, references to in-training that makes me think you're not a full-fledged engineer. Okay, so I would just leave the EIT designation because anybody that knows and cares would know what that meant. And I would remove like any spell outs of in-training. Um, I would say maybe fulfilled an engineering role. Again, maybe not um, as not I did this as an engineer in training, but maybe I did this, uh, or just don't say as an engineer, just say I did this. Um, I've done this. And if your experience says, if your like job title said engineer in training, then that's, you know, just leave it in there. But um, I wouldn't get caught up, again, as you, you kind of admitted it, that, you know, the title of engineer is protected. You know that the title of engineer is protected. Get that. But in companies, and they have, you know, job titles and job codes. And, and you might know, know the nuances of all the different job descriptions in a company. But you do know the job description of this company. So, if you meet all the requirements of this company for that role, I wouldn't get too harped up on what that company decides to, talk, to call it. Um, it might just be one of those things that it's like a HR or employment thing where they want to have a, a, a straight line number of rate codes. They don't want to have a different designation for engineer, engineer and training. They just have them paid diff compensated differently within the pay band. But again, I really wouldn't get so hung up on how that per interviewer wants to refer to you. Um, unless they're like the hiring manager that you'd be working with daily. But again, I really wouldn't get hung up too much on what the actual title that company uses. Because again, as long as you have the EIT designation after your name, it doesn't really matter. Anybody that knows and cares will understand. And theoretically, nobody should be... If you ask the question, are you expecting me to stamp things? And they say no, then there you go. They, they know that you're not a licensed engineer. So I really wouldn't get hung up on the titles. Uh, I wouldn't say engineer and training. That just sounds like a waste of space on your resume. Just put the EIT at the top and that's it. And unless you want to designate once you get your PE license that these were the things you did as an engineer in training and these are the things that you're doing as a licensed engineer. But I would not get too hung up on it. Um, you said that you were clearing your application that you're in EIT. Good. So as long as they read your application, good. They understand what you are. And yeah, I don't think you're going to miss out on opportunities. The title of the question says, deny a job because I called myself an EIT, asked for feedback, and I was told if you have all the requirements, that wouldn't be training anymore. Again, it sounds like this person just doesn't know what they're talking about. And maybe just I'm hoping that the questions you can ask them and, and be kind of understanding that they might not know all the different nuances, um, but just kind of not trying to raise a big stink about it is what I do and maybe if you meet another engineer in the company that is a licensed engineer um, you can kind of or isn't a licensed engineer but has that title you can kind of talk to them and, and understand um, how they approach it because I'm sure that as part of the interview process they might introduce you to other people that work there so yeah that's my long-winded answer but I just I just really wouldn't get too hung up on it I just really wouldn't get too hung up on it all right, next question. Is it appropriate to ask for a wage increase for an internship after the offer? Hello, I got an offer for an internship for the summer and after a meeting with a supervisor, I accepted the offer with a condition. The condition is that I find affordable housing around the area, but I made a blunder and said that their offering salary is completely reasonable. All right, this is key. After looking at housing options, it wasn't as affordable as I hoped and I might, not, I might be at a net loss in income. Very important. I understand I don't have much leverage since I'm an intern and the whole point of the internship is getting experience slash getting my foot in actual engineering experience, but I was wondering if it's acceptable slash appropriate if I request a small bump in the salary. If I ask, would it jeopardize my offer? All right. So here's what I'd say. You know, you, you, you I wouldn't say, well, you said that the condition is that you find affordable housing in the area and you're not finding affordable housing in the area. I wouldn't ask for a pay raise, but I would specifically ask them if they could give you a housing stipend. 
and maybe they can expense that a little bit differently or do some clever accounting or pull money from a different bucket. But it's kind of difficult to ask for like a straight up salary increase unless you want to just ask for it from the sense that I just can't find housing. I won't be afford, able to afford working for you otherwise. Um, but yeah, I think that I, I think it, you know, again, I, for large internship programs, it's kind of difficult to negotiate. I don't know how large of a firm this is, but I mean, you told them that you you needed to be able to found, find affordable housing. So I think it would it would be appropriate to say, hey, I'm. I'm not able to find affordable housing, and unfortunately, if I worked this internship, I would be losing money. Is there anything you can do to help me at least break even? I really want this experience. I really want to work here. I really like this company. I would really benefit from working in, under you and learning from you. Is there anything you can do to help me out? I think, I don't think that phrasing it that way would jeopardize your offer. What I think would jeopardize the offer is coming back to them and saying, hey, this salary is not enough without any other context. And just saying, hey, this salary isn't enough. I need more money. I think that that would be looked at as disingenuous. But as long as you pro approach it genuinely and say, hey, again, I said I needed housing. I'm not finding housing. Do you have any arrangements where you could set me up with affordable housing? Do you have any anybody that you can that help connect me with? Um, do you have any way they can give me some more money for help with housing? You edited in to say that since the pandemic, the company stopped offering housing for interns. Um, and you said that you'd be careful with your words and begin asking them if they could provide any housing assistance before asking for a raise. And I think that, that is a good approach. And again, I wouldn't look at it as a raise. Yeah, raise. I would just say, hey, I need help finding housing. I really want to work here. And maybe they'll be able to find some extra room in the budget. All right. Next question. I'm at my wits end. I graduated from an elite university with a degree in chemical engineering in August 2019. The problem is I finished with a 2.5 GPA. And my GPA while I was in school was even lower than that. The only job I had while I was in college was as a math tutor, so year after year of searching, I decided to become a math teacher in August 2020 for a year so I could earn money while I looked for an engineering job. Come June 2021, I was still looking, so I decided to teach for another year while I continued looking. Well, it's now April 2022, and I'll still, I'm still teaching and still looking. I can't get a job because I have no experience, and I have no experience because I can't get a job. The whole time I've been applying, editing, revising my resume, and really trying to get a job at companies like my local utilities companies, Raytheon, Texas Instruments, Tesla, and others. I've been applying to entry-level jobs as engineer, engineering intern, co-op, specialist, technician, operator, and still nothing. I either don't hear back from these companies or I hear back months later with a rejection. I don't know what to do anymore. I don't want to teach anymore. I studied engineering because that's what I want to do. All right, so this... Um, Here's what I have to say. I think that it's very aspirational, you know, Raytheon, TI, Tesla, but it's there's just so many more companies out there that hire engineers. And I think you need to start broadening your search radius, both physically and in the types of companies that you're looking for. You said you're applying for your local utilities and other jobs in your area, um, but there are thousands upon thousands of companies out there that do valuable work that aren't the brand names that you're mentioning. So, hey, say for example, if you really want to look for work for Texas Instruments or Tesla, maybe go look at the companies that supply for them, the smaller companies the, that may, may not be as sexy to all the other entry-level engineers that are looking on LinkedIn or Indeed, and apply to those companies. Look at your personal network. Do you have anybody that works for a small engineering firm or works for an engineering firm that you wouldn't even have realized is such a big corporate corporation. Like when I was in high school and college, I never had heard of Burns and McDonald or Jacobs or Zachary until I got to like my junior year. And oh my goodness, these companies are huge and they do so much work and there's so many jobs and they're constantly hiring people. Um, experience at one of those maybe less sexy consulting firms or at a smaller firm will get you much better results uh, trying to apply for the big companies you mentioned where you're going to be filtered out by some screener before your resume, resume even hits a person. Your resume is going to have a bunch of teaching experience on them on there and maybe 
I know that you want to have some teaching experience on there, but you know, hopefully I, you've included as many engineering projects and stuff you did while you were in college on your resume as possible. But yeah, look at your personal network and your personal connections. And that's the strongest thing that you've got going for you right now. You don't have a GP, good GPA. You went to a premier institution, but I don't know. I've never met anybody that really cared where I went to school. Um, and you have some experience, but you have your personal network and that's people that know what you do and, and that's it. So, um, the other thing I think about is again, location. Um, maybe it'll take you working in a less desirable location, like at a refinery in the middle of nowhere or like, a manufacturing plant on the side of town that you don't like to go to or a manufacturing plant in a small town maybe 45 minutes an hour and a half away from where you currently live and maybe it'll involve relocating but if you really really want to work as an engineer you don't have the gpa you're yes you went to a big school but again resume they don't really again, schools don't really care about that they more they more so care about the quality of the engineering education that you got um and the experience that you have and yeah, it's two years out and three years out. And it's really important that you get some engineering experience before people perceive that your degree has gone stale. So um, stop just applying to things that you see on LinkedIn and Indeed and then really start kind of pushing yourself to, and this subreddit, the Ask Engineers subreddit, or arc slash chemical engineering maybe approaching this group and saying hey what are some companies that do great chemical engineering work that are large companies that make a large impact on my daily life that I may have never heard of and maybe start applying at those companies because I don't know the, those Tesla jobs and those Amazon jobs and those TI jobs I mean they're looking for the best of the best and they have the ability to be very selective because they have thousands and thousands of applications coming in for each position every day or every week or every month or every year. So go for the the yield and the high probability stuff. So that's my best wishes for you. I wish you the best of luck, um, but that is what I do. All right, last question. People who went to a mediocre or low rank school, were you successful after? All right, so we just talked about somebody that couldn't get a job going to an elite university. Let's read this question. <laughs> People who went to a mediocre school like UC Irvine or UNLV, how successful were you in terms of getting a high paying job? Is it possible to get into a top paying job with a mid tier college or not? Were you judged by your college choice and work? Okay. So let's answer this question. People who went to a mediocre school like UC Irvine or UNLV. All right. I know nothing about UC Irvine or UNLV. If I'm a potential employer, I'm like, oh, I've heard of those schools. Let's look up the program that this person went to. Oh, cool. It's accredited. Great. All right. They're qualified. Now let me interview them. See what kind of personality they have. See what kind of experience they have. See what they bring to the table. See what they talk about what they've learned. That's what I'm hiring them based off of. I could care less where anybody went to school. So I don't personally think that, at least in my field of engineering, that the school you went to is directly determinant of you getting a high paying job. I think the connections that you leverage that you might get from going to that school can impact your career and the, maybe the quality of projects or the quality of internships that you got while you were going to that school because that school might have connected you to them influences your ability to have a high paying job but who you are as a person what you bring to the table what you can demonstrate that you've learned how you communicate how you how your work ethic that is significantly more determinant of your probability for getting a high paying job and being successful in your career than the name of the school that you went to. If a person came to me and all they could talk about is where they went to school other than the fact that oh fond memories or oh it was a great program really happy I went there. If somebody comes to me and says hey I went to Harvard you gotta hire me I'm bright and smart because I went to Harvard and I'm constantly talking about the fact that they went to the Harvard I, I just find that so annoying 
and off-putting. Um, if you've watched The Office, you've seen Andy in the way that he's made fun of. I mean, that is the way that I would perceive somebody that just bragged all the time about where they went to school. Um, next question is, is it possible to get uh, into a top-paying job with a mid-tier college or not? First of all, is UC Irvine or UNLV a mid-tier college? I mean, what defines a mid-tier college? I mean, who gives a dang? Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Were you judged by your college choice and work? Nobody has asked me where I went to college, other than casually. Nobody's asked me where I went to college as like a measure of how credible I am. And when I tell people I went to school, they're like, oh, that's a cool school. They don't know anything about the engineering program. They're like, oh, I've heard of it. Oh, UC Irvine. Oh, cool. I saw them in March Madness this one year. Or UNLV. Oh, they had a good football program that one year. They beat TCU or whatever. I mean, nobody cares. <laughs> nobody cares. At least in the business professional setting. Maybe like the quality of MBA program that you went to or if you went... <sighs> nobody cares. Nobody cares. All right, and that's the podcast. Um, yeah, select your school based on what you're, where you're going to learn the most and make a good financial investment. That's all I have to say. That's the podcast. So thank you for listening to this episode of the Engineering Success Podcast. Thanks to our top-tier supporter, Jonathan Ott. Really appreciate you, man. You can join him if you subscribe on Patreon or on Anchor. And... As always, I will get back to you hopefully in a couple weeks, but hopefully not a month from now. Thanks for listening to the podcast. I'll catch you next time. I'm not complaining. No, I'm not complaining. My thoughts get complicated. I cannot explain in lameness. Never losing focus because I ain't chasing payments. Still playing in the basement while I'm working on arrangements. They heard the kid in 50 countries. Thank God that's amazing. But I'd rather think Spotify. They put me on the station.